Welcome to 1ABQ and You, Conversations, Culture, and Community, a City of Albuquerque production with your hosts, Mayor Tim Keller and me, Leah Black. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today, we are going to learn a lot of interesting history about New Mexico. It's true. And, you know, I think we're in varying degrees familiar with different parts of our history, but one of the underrepresented parts by far is our African-American story. And so we're so lucky to be joined by Rita Powdrell, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about that, I'm sure. And of course, also essentially a household name, uh, right, because of the wonderful uh, family restaurant that they've operated for so long. So uh, we're in for a treat. Welcome back to the show. Uh, this I'm very excited to have you on our show. Rita Powdrell is I would call you an institution in the community. I mean, oh. there are so many facets to what you have done for the community. But first of all, you're the executive director of the African American Museum of, and Cultural Center of New Mexico. Correct. In 1983, you and your family opened Mr. Powdrell's Barbecue House, which is definitely an Albuquerque institution. <laughs> Um, I'm actually hungry right now thinking about it. You are the winner of multiple awards, including the Living Legend Award from the UNM Black Alumni Chapter and the State of New Mexico's Distinguished Public Service Award. Welcome, Rita Powdrell, to the show. Thank you so much. We're really happy to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, so usually on this show, we, we talk about all sorts of things in, in a very kind of casual way. But we also want to take a little bit of time to just... Uh, uh, hear your story a little bit. And so, um, you know, tell us about kind of your New Mexico journey or your family's New Mexico journey and and uh, how it's gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so my new personal New Mexico journey is kind of like I was born and raised in Pennsylvania hmm. uh, and stayed there till I was 18. So I was kind of like there was a plant, my parents, that was rooted in Pennsylvania, and I was one of the seeds, and I blew away, <laughs> and my roots came to New Mexico by way of the University of uh -huh. New Mexico, and this became my home. Oh, I wow. love it. And how did, why did you pick UNM? I Out picked UNM because um, my dad was a physician, and he would go to uh, conventions, and the last two years they were in L.A. Mm. So we drove, we took Route 66, and uh, we came through, of course, the center of, you know, Albuquerque. Yeah. We came down Central Avenue, and I saw the University of New Mexico, and I saw these wide streets, and there were no people on them. <laughs> now, when you're in Pittsburgh, there's yeah. so many people on the street that you're literally almost rubbing shoulders. And so I found that, along with the uh, architecture, I found that social distance of not mm. seeing people yeah, so open. different, yeah, that it just fascinated me. So when I started applying to colleges, I applied to UNM. Mm. Wow. We love that you're here. And then how did it happen with your family? So uh, so that's my, so then I married into, um, I married Joe Padrell, who's mm. part of the uh, Padrell family, and their family came in 1958. And theirs was also a, kind of a differing New Mexico story because they were leaving the oppression of segregated schooling and sharecropping that was going on in western Texas where they were from and their mother said no I want my kids to uh, have a different type of educational experience than they're going to get here and so she hopped in a station wagon and and then they came here and and started the first Padrells. Uh, the 1983 is the one that I'm involved in that started on 4th Street, but actually the first one started in 1962. Oh, wow. Ah, okay. And where was that location? So they had several before it became really successful. So they had the first one on Broadway, and then they had one on Carlisle, and then they had one on San Pedro oh, that wow. people remember. Mm -hmm. And then finally they had um, purchased their own location on East Central. Yeah. Mm. Um, I want to talk a little bit. I think a lot of people don't realize how much black history we have in New Mexico. Um, it gets highlighted in other bigger cities, maybe more metropolitan cities, but we have a very vibrant history here. Do you want to talk about that? Um, we do, and we have a very unique history of 
why people entered into the state of New Mexico. So African Americans, well, Africans, came to the state of New Mexico during exploration mm. with the Spaniards. And so the Spaniards, of course, enslaved Africans. And many times they would have as many as five enslaved Africans that they brought with them on the exploration and the conquest of the territory of New Mexico. And those Africans that came with the Spaniards were given their names. And so they had names like Candelaria, and Naranjo, wow. and they participated in the early history of New Mexico in the Pueblo revolts. In fact, there were two brothers, and one was on the Pueblo side, and the other stayed with the Spaniard side. Oh, really? So, and then those Africans started to intermarry with the indigenous population of the state. And so, but that was your first wave of um, Africans that came into the state. And then, of course, after the Civil War, there was another wave of African Americans coming west. And the biggest impetus of that, there were two. One was the Homestead Act that came out in 1862. Well, it was um, the West really took advantage of the Homestead Act. And so people were able to have the advantage of owning land. And they could get 160 acres of land. Oh. And as long as they were a citizen, hadn't taken up arms against the United States, stayed on the land for five years, and paid a filing fee of $10. Wow. They could. Of course, back then, it was, I, I mean, you still had to improve the land. Uh, and so it was a big enterprise. Um, mm -hmm. You got the land, but a lot of times you didn't have capital. Right. You know, and you did yeah, have to till there. the land. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, so there were a lot of uh, people that didn't make it on uh, homesteads, but New Mexico overall, not just for Af African Americans, is a homestead state. And they did pass um, two more homestead acts. They did the one of uh, 1909, which increased the amount of land you had, could get to 320 acres. And then they did the one of 1919, where you could actually get 640 acres of land with mm. the same stipulation. And all of that was specific. Those two were specific to the West. So given the social context of the Civil War mm -hmm. and what was happening after the Civil War and the oppression that was starting in the South with the Jim Crow laws, um, the ability in the state of New Mexico for African Americans to acquire land right. ownership became a very foundational part of African American history in Albuquerque. Albuquerque, a lot of African Americans homesteaded in Albuquerque or the village of Albuquerque or the territory uh, mm. that it was then. So you had that influx. Uh, and then coinciding with that, you had the Buffalo Soldiers who were sent to the state of New Mexico mainly because uh, the other soldiers were defecting. So they had a 30% in the army of people were defecting because they just had the Civil War. Nobody wanted to come out west to do what. And so the Buffalo soldiers, the African Americans who were uh, in a state of angst because what do we do? We're coming out of slavery. We're facing all this hostility. So uh, becoming a Buffalo soldier became sort of a place of refuge. Mm -hmm. And then uh, so they, so you had that entry of African Americans in the in the West. And then you also had the third thing that coincides is you had the railroads. And the railroads were, were allowing people, you know, to come to the West and having transportation and all of those things were kind of happening at the same time. And of course, many African Americans worked on the railroads. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately stayed and built families and, and you know, became well, part of I, culture. Well, I think one of the things about um, land ownership is Yes, once you own yeah. land in a place and, and then coming out of something, coming out of enslavement and coming out of all those uncertainties, the ability to own land 
cause communities to yeah. happen, yeah. you know, and, and it was quite a few African Americans who come west. We talk about the great migration to the north, but we seldom talk about the migration That's to true. the west. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it happened in the 1900s, not yeah, the 1800s. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so, so once you come, what do you do? So the first thing you do is you uh, establish uh, your religion, your religion, right. you know, so the people who had land, um, most of the time the African Americans who homesteaded had to have jobs, full-time jobs, in order to cultivate and till the land. Yeah. You know, so they started the churches and then then once you have churches, how are we? How do we interact with one another? And so then you get your social organizations that, you know, happen. And then because there was ownership of land, the other thing that's really unique about African Americans in New Mexico is the amount of entrepreneurship that goes on here. Mm -hmm. Because when you own your own land, then you can, you start to do entrepreneurial things. So you know, you start to have you know barbers and beauticians mm -hmm. and you start to have restaurants and you know you start to have clubs and and people had rental properties and hotels so the amount of entrepreneurship among the African American communities across the the state was pretty amazing. So you had the southern part of the state, like Las Cruces had a lot of homesteading, Albuquerque had, Clayton, New Mexico, Raton, New Mexico, places mm. that we don't think about. So that so now you've got churches, you've got social organizations, and um, you have the entrepreneurship, and then you have the way we have to interact with um, what's going on in New Mexico? What type of integration, segregation are we fight, uh, facing, mm -hmm. you know, in this state? And, you know, and how do we negotiate that? And one of the things that's interesting about New Mexico is it kind of, when um, General Sherman, when he goes through and he meets with 20 African-American ministers and says, what can we do for the African-American population coming out of this terrible war? And what they said is, all we need to do is own land. And if we own land, we can till it, and we can harvest it, and we will do just fine. And that happens in New Mexico, mm. you know, that the, there's this ability to own land, to harvest it, to till it, which means that we had um, our own integral communities, yes. you know, so we had, so in all these little places, you had African American communities. So Albuquerque or the village, you know, has a tight knit African American community, as does Raton, has a tight knit, you know, um, African American community. And because we're only about two or three percent of the population, mm -hmm. We knew each other mm -hmm. in those days. So everybody, mm -hmm. so if you have churches, right, so the church in Las Cruces, the minister there would go once a week, you know, once a month to the church in Las Vegas, you know, and oh, then wow. you, yeah, you know, so your churches are, and then they're having their conventions. In the community. And so, yeah, and yeah. then you're having your organizations, like uh, one of the women's organizations was Home Circle, 1914, but you have all these women's organizations concerned about the children and the education of the young, and they're having meetings. So literally, the African American population of the whole state of New Mexico knew each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's very close knit across so, all right. those miles. Yeah. yeah, and I'm just curious a little bit about Albuquerque. I mean, I, and I, I'm probably remembering this wrong, but uh, I remember even uh, my family used to work for uh, the Montgomerys. And uh, I always heard that that street actually is not named after the city of Montgomery. It's actually named after Homesteaders, the last name Montgomery. Um, and uh, is that does that does that uh, I've heard a lot of our streets are named after African American homesteaders. Is that is it true? You know, I well, I know that um, the East End Edition mm. was a um, a housing. Um, area that was built on homestead land that was originally owned uh, by Dr. Uh, Lewis. And um, 
eventually gets to Virginia Ballou. And at mm. 29, she takes a homestead in around 1954 and decides that she's going to make it a place where African Americans can have homes and reside. Mm. And so when they plotted at, platted out, yeah, they named the streets after sure, the people family. they yeah. knew. Yeah. 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 So many of the streets, yes, are named after African Americans, her relatives, her brother, yeah. Yeah, that's so, a cool oh, very piece cool. of history. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, we so so as we hear you uh, share this tremendous history, it, it's a great reminder, you know, having been born and raised here, you know, that we have all sorts of educational deficits on a number of fronts. But one is certainly local African American history. And tell us about your efforts with the museum and this this journey you've been on to make sure there's a place where we can all learn about the history you just shared. Well, I mean, our our journey with the museum came, started with family, and then branched out into what is the African-American family of New Mexico, mm -hmm. you know. And, and um, so the first thing we did was we partnered. I was with a group called the Grio Society at first that turns into the African-American Museum. So we partnered with the Humanities Council, and we started doing oral histories within the African-American mm -hmm. community of Albuquerque first, you know. and. Um, we called that exhibit, which uh, for Albuquerque was a 16-panel exhibit, New Mexico's African-American Legacy, Visible, Vital, and Valuable. And we looked at the um, African-Americans who came to the to the village of Albuquerque and the things they did. So John Collins was one of the ones that we showcased, and he was a Buffalo soldier, and he was responsible for all the trees around the University of New Mexico. He used to bring mm. them from the mountains and plant them around the university. And, and so, and then we just started doing that exhibit, but as we moved to different communities, we wanted to be sure that we had the history of that that community. Mm -hmm. So we started collaborating. So in Las Cruces, we collaborated with Dr. Uh, Clarence Fielder, and they had done the African American history of Las Cruces, which we mm -hmm. combined with ours. And then we went to Santa Fe, and then we went to Las Vegas. So, uh, and then we did Raton. And uh, so we have the af early African American history of all these cities, and our dream is as a museum to have of the African American history of all the communities throughout New Mexico and to keep adding, you know, th that history mm -hmm. in. And then, as you know, we did um, recently. So as you do these histories, you get themes. And of course, one of the themes was homesteading. Mm -hmm. And so we went into that theme a little bit more. And we did Facing the Rising Sun with the, in collaboration with the city of Albuquerque and Electric Playhouse, where we actually looked into you know, homesteading and what owning land meant and made an interactive exhibit and looked at some of the amazing things like the East End Edition that was on homestead land, like Mr. Pettis in Las Cruces who owned his own water utility company, something mm. that was very rare. He owned his own water utility company and off of his 640 acres that turned into a thousand, he uh, sold one acre plots and so all those people that bought one acre plots, he supplied water to from his water utility company. Wow. So you just get these fascinating mm. stories of entrepreneurship that happened directly because we had the ability to own land in the state of New Mexico. And then we get to um, take this history and put it on panels and exhibit in museums throughout the state, which is what we've done. So we interview, I mean, um, we did a exhibit at the Albuquerque Museum, the Farm and Ranch Heritage Museum, the Roswell Museum, Hispanic Cultural Center. I mean, we've been all over the state um, trying to make sure that this history is visible. And because, the stories are told, yeah. And the stories are told. And we do panel presentations because um, one of the things when you do history is you start to see how cultures overlap. 
So when you get into, so Albuquerque history, for instance, when you get into the Albuquerque history, one of the things that happens is uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, um, you have um, integration, but you have many African American teachers who are left without jobs. Oh. And one of the places that they had jobs was in the West through the BIA system where they were trying to get yeah. teachers to go to the reservations. So they were pulling in many, many African Americans f for schools in Albuquerque and in Grants and in Farmington and bringing them into the state, which causes more entrepreneurship because mostly they were women, so they need beauticians. Right. You know, so then that business. Symbiotic. But then, yeah, and then you, but, you, but then you're interacting with another culture. You're in, interacting with another mm -hmm. culture of New Mexico and its history, you know, so you're actually interacting with a culture where the children have been taken away and put in, in a school and who aren't allowed to bring their culture with them to those schools. So, you know, you start mm -hmm. to get pick up that history along with African American history. I mm. could talk to you about this for, I mean, there's so many things I've learned just in this 20 minutes that yeah. I, it's, it's amazing. Um, unfortunately, we do have to wrap up, but uh, Rita, you are again, the executive director of the African American Museum and Cultural Center of New Mexico. I encourage everyone to go and learn about these stories and learn about this history. Thank you. Thanks so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Albuquerque, we love you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for listening to Albuquerque. And remember, it takes all of us to fulfill the promise of the city we call home. We'll see you again next time on 1ABQ and you. Be sure and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow us at hashtag 1ABQ and you. If you'd like to share your own ABQ observations, experiences, or topic suggestions, reach out to us. You've been listening to 1ABQ and you.